Well, as you can uh, imagine, I mean, it's, uh, it's a special, special pleasure and a, a special honor, I mean, to, uh, to be invited back, I mean, to the same place, I mean, 34 years later, or uh, um, um, 25 years later. And uh, it, uh, it is really, uh, uh, of course, an occasion to, uh, to reflect upon uh, uh, those times in the uh, 1970s and uh, what has happened since then and uh, what kind of uh, outlook we may have now from uh, what we have learned and what we have experienced over this uh, uh, third of a century. Um, I see, I mean, there are some uh, veterans of my own generation uh, who are here, but uh, most of you are uh, too young, I mean, to uh, have been around in, in the 1970s. So uh, perhaps we should start by uh, uh, reminding uh, ourselves a bit about the, the, um, uh, the, the world of that time. Uh, one of the uh, uh, things in the in the book, what does the Lumen class do when it moves, which immediately situates it in, in the 1970s, is its aim at connecting uh, empirical social theory and revolutionary politics in the advanced capitalist countries. Um, I wouldn't dream of doing that today. Um, <laughs> So uh, we have to remember, I mean, the, the political context, uh, which was on the one hand, I mean, the, uh, the broad uh, political, but also cultural and social uh, movement, uh, which is summed up in the word of 1968. Uh, the waves of, of this movement uh, were still rolling in the, in the 1970s. And there was the, uh, the victory, the Vietnamese victory in the Vietnam War, uh, which uh, uh, was a decisive uh, victory, one of the most clear-cut uh, victories of uh, anti-imperialist forces in, in, um, in the world, in world history, actually. But the most powerful uh, imperial power of, of the world was was defeated. Um, and uh, in the uh, situation in, in, in Europe, uh, there were, uh, uh, a, uh, in the 1970s, uh, a uh, series of uh, major working class protest movements and, and massive strikes, many of them are successful like the British minor strike of, of 1974, which actually uh, 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 more or less toppled, I mean, the Tory government. Um, and um, this was the, uh, the period uh, of, the, of the Portuguese revolution in 1974, uh, and the death of Franco in Spain in 1975, which opened up uh, a, a completely new political uh, future in, in, in Spain. And it was the, um, in political terms, it was the, the launching of a movement of um, democratic communists, which was uh, uh, known as, as Euro Communist, um, a joint effort by the Italian, French, and Spanish communist parties. And it was also related to um, uh, left-wing uh, socialist parties. There was in, in, in France in 1977 a, uh, a joint political program of the socialists and the communist party, the United Left, which uh, uh, in uh, uh, the summer of 1978, when I finished this book, um, looked uh, uh, probably uh, uh, as, uh, as a winner in the, in the autumn election in, in France. So that was the, the political context. Um, there was also a, an intellectual context which uh, we should uh, uh, remember and, and in order to understand the book and in particular style. Uh, 
one thing was what, what Erich mentioned. I mean, this was the time when, when Marx was just breaking into the universities after having been banned in, in, in most universities of the world. Um, and, um, it was also uh, in, uh, intellectually the, uh, a period of, uh, or right after, uh, the, the, uh, the breakthrough of, of structuralism, the height of structuralist uh, uh, thought. Uh, originally uh, in coming from, from linguistics and poetics, uh, but um, very well established in anthropology with the work of, of uh, Claude lévi Um a work which, by the way, I mean, convinced Pierre, Pierre Bourdieu, I mean, that sociology or social science was, was something uh, seriously enough, I mean, for a French philosopher to, to deal with. So, I mean, the previous French sociology uh, was regarded as, as something which uh, uh, people who couldn't really make it into uh, a good philosopher, they moved on to the sociology. But with the work of Lévi Spors, uh, uh, sort of scientific rigor had, had entered social science. Um, and that was the, yeah, the early work of, of Michel Foucault, uh, a kind of structuralist uh, history of science and, and of uh, modes of thought. Uh, in uh, psychoanalysis, that was the work of, of uh, uh, Lacan. Um, and this, all, all this had its, its impact in, in, in Marxist with the uh, works of Louis Althusser and his uh, uh, disciples from the mid-1960s, which uh, 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 had a, a great, great impact at the time and, and certainly had a great impact on me. And that's... Uh, that kind of intellectual context, I think one has to bear in mind in order to understand some of the ways in which the book was, was written. So what can we say now, I mean, about the, this period and the author's stands of, at that time? Well, I've, I've looked at them in, in uh, or that was in four uh, uh, aspects and so on, I mean, the, the kind of values which were driving us, which are still, I mean, uh, are still, Standing, at least I'm uh, uh, still uh, standing by them without qualifications. I mean, there were uh, values of global uh, freedom and global uh, equality against all kinds of imperialism and, and exploitation and oppression. And the, um, the critiques, uh, uh, I think, were also uh, largely on, on, uh, on target. Uh, there were primarily, of course, I mean, critiques of the various kinds of uh, obscuring the brutality of capitalism and imperialism, and of the demonization of communism and Cold War liberalism. Uh, but there was also some specific polemics against comrades, friends, and colleagues on the left, which uh, I I don't regret, and I, I think they were basically correct, but I would, they are less, much less relevant now, and I would be uh, much more ecumenical now than I was at that time. Um, but it was, uh, for instance, I mean, a, a, critique, of, a critique of critiques, uh, meaning a, a kind of radical stance that uh, values and critiques are uh, more important in uh, intellectual work and social studies than the production of scientific knowledge. Uh, this led me to a, a, a critique of the Frankfurt School, for instance. And uh, there was also, uh, a, which is, comes out very clearly in the book, a kind of critique of the, what I saw as the subjectivism and the idealism of a great deal of, of uh, uh, radical uh, social analysis and kind of lack of, of understanding of the uh, uh, patterns of determination in which actors, including those powerful actors, were involved. 
On the whole, I think I would still stand by those critiques, although I, as I say, I mean, I, not only have I mellowed a bit with, with age, but also I think, I mean, some of these critiques are much less important now. I mean, at that time, I thought it was absolutely uh, uh, crucial, I mean, first to, to, to uh, uh, create a space for scientific Marxism, or for a Marxist oriented to, 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 to scientific knowledge, and not having it drowned in, in, in values and denunciations of, of the existing world. And uh, uh, there was also a, a need to, uh, to create a space for a more structural approach to social phenomena. Um, and later on, I mean, made my piece with Jürgen Habermas, uh, 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 and, uh, we both now regard, I mean, those polemics uh, uh, of the time as, as overcome. Um, then there is the, the uh, uh, thirdly, I mean, uh, these uh, books on, on the state, on the ideology, and on social science, the first one in the Marxist trilogy, um, science, class, and society. Uh, all of them uh, attempted to develop analytical frameworks for uh, analysis and to provide um, explanations for various um, uh, phenomena, including, for instance, I mean, one thing which is not uh, really treated in those two books you mentioned, but which themes I, I worked on at the same time in those books was a, a, a history of the rise of democracy or the right to vote and how did that come about in, in, uh, in, in capitalist societies. Uh, I think, I mean, these frameworks are still useful, but we'll see how far they will survive, I mean, these days of intensive discussion. But, but um, uh, personally, I think, I mean, they are still useful, although, um, of course, um, social science uh, uh, and social knowledge has advanced, I mean, since, since the 1970s. It would be ridiculous to um, uh, argue otherwise, say that 34 years ago, I mean, it was a definite formulation of anything. Uh, the main thing, I mean, which makes this a uh, book, so particularly the what does the rule in the rule, uh, the bound to its time, is its prospects. It's, I mean, they were obviously uh, grossly exaggerated and kind of having uh, that time relatively uh, young uh, scholars of overtaken by, by his values and, and hopes. On the other hand, I should say, I mean, finally, I mean, that uh, these kind of radical or revolutionary prospects are not completely inconceivable. I mean, you have to remember that. I mean, and I still think, even in, even 34 years later, that had the uh, French elections of 1978 uh, ended in a different way, I mean, with the, with the victory of the United Left, I think a great deal of, of, of European history, particularly Western European history, would have been uh, would have been different. It would have had great repercussions in Spain and Italy, and um, uh, Portugal probably, and the whole political climate in, in Western Europe would have been rather different. Um, but, and, and the um, the defeat in 1978, I mean, was uh, was certainly not a foregone conclusion. I mean, it was a pretty tight election. But this is the, the way social science functions. And so on. I mean, there are contingent events which uh, uh, puts the, the the train of history in that direction or in that direction, and uh, you can't really predict what will happen. Uh, I should say one thing about the, the structural problematic, which I think, which uh, some people, I've seen some of the uh, very interesting uh, uh, comments and questions which students have made uh, on these books and which we'll discuss later on in this week. 
Um, but I think I, mean, I should say something about why uh, the book has this structural emphasis. And uh, one uh, reason is the, is the problem of theorizing uh, class and state action. Because uh, on the one hand, I mean, uh, Marx is full of class and class action, and class struggle, class conflict, class power, class rule, everything like that. And on the other hand, if you think, uh, and, and in, in everyday language, I mean, we understand more or less, I mean, what we mean by that. But if you, if you want to theorize about it, um, and you think a bit uh, more uh, deeply about it, you uh, come, may come to the conclusion, as I did, I mean, that uh, a, a clause is, not, is usually not an actor in the strict sense. Um, because I, a class doesn't have any uh, decision-making process or machinery as a class. Um, there is no, in, uh, no such thing, or very rarely such a thing, as a committee of the ruling class deciding uh, what to do and how to rule. And uh, a state as a whole is also seldom an, an actor. I mean, the government is, in a particular state apparatus, the army, the police, the social agency, the ministry of education, or what have you. Um, so, in, in order to deal with this, and particularly, I mean, with a very, for, for in a Marxist problematic, extremely important uh, form of class action, like class rule, ruling class rule, um, you have to account for this complexity of action. And I think that the, I thought, and I still think, that the best way of doing that is to uh, look at it, I mean, through a, uh, the, the lens of systemic reproduction, and systemic conflicts and contradictions. Um, that's, that, that's why, I mean, the, uh, there is this sometimes uh, uh, a bit uh, heavy structural language, perhaps. Uh, 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 but it, the, the intention is to get at um, something which sounds very, uh, very simple and very straightforward like uh, the ruling class rules. Uh, but in, in fact, I mean, in most historical, empirical cases, is an extremely complex social and political process. <coughs> okay, so, uh, so much about the, 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 um, the old days and the times. Let us now look uh, a bit at what has happened, I mean, since then. And, and, um, uh, Uh, the 1970s was a, 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 um, a period in which uh, uh, Marxists uh, <coughs> tended to discover the state, and there, there was a proliferation of debates about the state and, and uh, uh, what it was and what uh, ruling class rule actually uh, uh, meant. Uh, something which um, which had been uh, uh, present in uh, some parts of classical Marxism, Lenin uh, and, and Gramsci in, in particular, but after that, after the death of Lenin and Gramsci, not much had been done. Now, the, uh, one of the uh, questions uh, which have been raised since then is that um, are states important anymore? I mean, aren't states declining? insignificance. And that has been, of course, I mean, the, the thrust of the so-called globalization discourse in the 1990s, both on the right and on the left. Um, I tend to think that that kind of, of argument about the decline of states and the decline of the significance of states is, is basically wrong. And that, um, um, for one thing, I mean, uh, we have more nation states than ever in, in, in world history.
and there is still, as you know, I mean, a waiting list or a waiting room for uh, aspiring nation states. But not only that, it's also, I mean, if we look at what has happened to uh, um, uh, the, the size of, of, of states, um, advanced capitalist states, including the American one, are actually larger today than they were when I wrote that book. Uh, in, in the sense of, larger in the sense of the share of, uh, the share of state revenue or of state expenditure in, uh, in the total uh, territorial economy. Um, actually, at the uh, size of, of uh, advanced capitalist states in this sense, uh, uh, peaked around 2000 and has stayed on this high plateau ever since. Um, some oscillations by, uh, by uh, conjunctures of the business cycle. Uh, and in uh, some other parts of the world, in, in Latin America, I mean, there have been uh, since around, since the early 1990s, a, a tendential uh, uh, or a trend, I mean, of expansion of, of states, which is still, still continuing. So uh, uh, states uh, are still important. And um, um, <coughs> uh, they, uh, uh, I don't think uh, contemporary capitalism can be understood in, in terms of uh, a decline of, um, of states. Uh, there is then uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the analysis of class societies, I mean, which is one, another of the uh, four key of, of the analysis of the 1970s. And uh, here, uh, I, I think we have to admit, and I would certainly like to admit, I mean, that we did have at, at that time a much too simple um, conception of, of society, capitalist societies, as two uh, simply uh, class societies. Some of these uh, 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 complications, I mean, have been discussed at length, and you all know about it. I mean, the sex, gender, uh, uh, weakness, of, of, uh, or blindness of, of uh, uh, Marxism, which was uh, the object of a very heavy and mostly uh, well-deserved and justified feminist critique um, has also been uh, a, a not so much written about ethnicity and race. Um, and religion, uh, I think there were very few of us in the 1970s and 1980s who uh, could imagine, I mean, the the significance, including the political significance of, um, of religion. Um, and we were in, 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 uh, in good company, but well, I mean, the whole sort of uh, modernist and liberal tradition uh, tended to neglect I mean, the, the enduring uh, significance of, of religion. To some extent, this was an, an effect of Eurocentrism. Europe is, of course, uh, the, the most secularized part of the world. Um, and Scandinavia, or where I come from, is the most secularized part of Europe. So, um, we were parochial or provincial in, in that sense, not understanding the power of religion. And I also think uh, that the, um, uh, the discussions of, of the civic sphere, or the public sphere, uh, was something which we didn't pay much attention to. Although I remember the, um, uh, the, the, the great intellectual uh, experience I had when, when reading um, Jürgen Habermas' masterful uh, uh, work, Strukturwandel uh, der Öffentlichkeit. I don't know what it's called in, in, in English, but the, uh, uh, the, the, the rise of of a, uh, of a bourgeois public sphere, and which some interesting German writers then uh, took further into 
uh, analysis of the development of a proletarian public sphere. But there are two things which I would like to, to underline in particular with the complications of class society. Uh, we were not uh, obvious at the time. Uh, uh, one was the, uh, the specifically European salience of class, uh, which is something which follows from the European road to modernity, which was basically one of civil war and revolution or alternatively negotiations and compromises and reforms, but nevertheless were sort of internal and um, uh, which um, pitted, I mean, the, the aristocracy, uh, the high church um, uh, against the, uh, the bourgeoisie and the more popular classes in a very clear-cut way. Uh, this did not happen in, 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 other, in other parts of the world. And Europe was also uh, something that dawned upon me uh, 10 years uh, uh, afterwards, after I wrote this book. Europe was, only, or was the only part of the world in which um, industrial employment uh, became dominant in post-agrarian societies. And that, again, uh, 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 had its importance for the salience of class in Europe. Of, uh, uh, the, uh, clear sort of uh, division between the industrial working class and, uh, and, and other uh, social uh, groups and classes. Um, and then there is this, uh, uh, if we think of, of, um, of the world in more global terms, and in terms of global history, there is the twen what we may call the 20th century paradox, which is that uh, this, was the, this was the century in world history in which inter-country uh, differences and inter-country polarization in economic and social development was uh, the largest ever. It sort of peaked around 1950 or mid-20th mid uh, uh, century. Uh, but at the same time, um, um, the 20th century was also the period of uh, the most explicit and uh, widespread class struggles uh, and, and explicit uh, uh, so there is a, uh, an interesting contradiction in this in, in the thing or paradox. The, the, uh, uh, the period in which uh, inter-country, international, uh, inter-territorial polarization was large was also the, the, the period in which internal class conflict was uh, most developed. Um, and that uh, should take us into further analysis of uh, 20th century articulations of class and nationalism. Something which has been done, but not yet, I mean, on a, on a large systematic and global, and global scale. <coughs> Although we all know, I mean, that the, the Vietnamese and the Chinese uh, revolutions, for instance, I mean, uh, uh, their success uh, were, uh, uh, was due to this particular articulation of, of class and, and, uh, and nationalism. But that is another thing, I mean, it complicates the, the, uh, the, uh, the standard uh, <coughs> analysis of class societies which we did in the 1970s. In one other respect, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, the later development has made some of the uh, edges of um, the uh, 1970s Marxist critique um, less necessary because um, at that time uh, the uh, capitalist was a was a uh, I don't know whether you can possibly use that word in the United States, a nigger word. Uh, I, I mean by that, I mean a, a word which, which only uh, anti-capitalists uh, used. 
like Negro is a, a word only racist uh, 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 use. Otherwise, I mean, uh, capitalism was, uh, oh, we, we had a mixed economy. Uh, that was the managerial revolution. There were stakeholder firms um, and what have you. And, and um, talking about capitalism in the 1960s and 1970s immediately uh, uh, branded you as a, as a socialist or a communist. Nowadays, I mean, it's, it's a quite respectable uh, thing, it's something you can defend. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, idea that firms were uh, run by, or corporations were run by managers <coughs> balancing various stakeholder interests is something which has been overrun I mean, by, by uh, focus on uh, property rights, on shareholder values, um, and, and so on. And, the, and uh, politics has to uh, pay attention to the so-called investment climate. It's something which is now uh, banal. So in that sense, uh, uh, the, uh, some of the uh, critical work we, we, we did at that time, I mean, is uh, ironically uh, uh, over, overrun by, by uh, capitalism's own uh, ideological development. So let us now then uh, 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 go into a, a third uh, set of, of uh, issues. Uh, what has happened, I mean, to, to capitalism uh, uh, since, since the 1970s? Uh, I think uh, we have to admit, or at least I have to admit, uh, not to have noticed, the, the watershed which in capitalist history, which took place in the 1970s and uh, early 1980s. Uh, one was uh, the deindustrialization of the uh, uh, advanced capitalist countries something which I did discover in the, uh, in the, in the early 1980s, but I was, I was writing about uh, working class movements and, and uh, class power. Uh, but it was something which had started already, I mean, in 1965, in some countries of the OECD, which accelerated with the 1973-1974 crisis. And that was a historical term of, of, of social relations in, in, in uh, capitalism. Another thing which uh, didn't dawn upon me, at least, uh, until much later, was the, the significance of um, the fi financialization of, of capitalism from the 1980s with the uh, development of um, the uh, uh, transnational uh, euro bond and euro dollar markets uh, with currency trading um, running into uh, enormous size and the um, deregulation of capital movements in the mid 1980s. And thirdly, uh, historically seen, and there is also, uh, it happened or uh, began uh, uh, or developed a bit later, but from the late 1980s and onward, we also had what we may call, uh, uh, with the German term, a new Gründerzeit, a new uh, foundational moment of entrepreneurial capitalism. This was the uh, electronic revolution and uh, uh, firms like uh, uh, Apple, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, and others uh, made it uh, uh, to the world. Um, so uh, uh, there is also a, a, a geoeconomic uh, uh, shift uh, which has taken place. Um, which, interestingly enough, I mean, was not noticed in the in the heat of the globalization debates, uh, of apologies or critiques of globalization in the 1990s, 
Uh, but uh, became clear, I mean, only in the beginning of, of this century. But while the, that debate was going on, and uh, uh, while the, um, the U.S. was uh, preoccupied with, with, uh, with Islam and Al-Qaeda and the Middle East, um, the, the whole terrain of capitalist geoeconomics was shifting. Um, um, uh, to Asia and the uh, emergence of this new acronym, the BRICS, which is a, a typical so 21st century formulation. And uh, we are uh, approaching, I think, I mean, the end of uh, half a millennium of North Atlantic world hegemony. Well, I should add, perhaps, that I have never been, and I'm still not, part of the that uh, current of the left uh, who, is, who uh, think that the, the United States and U.S. capitalism is going to decline rapidly. Um, I think it still has a great economic um, and cultural strength. Um, but it, it's obvious, I mean, that the, the, the North Atlantic area, sort of NATO land, is uh, a, a, losing its uh, dominant position in the world. There is another uh, thing which has uh, uh, happened and which is, of course, interesting and important uh, to analyze from a class perspective and a Marxist, Marxist perspective, uh, which is the, uh, the rise of what might be called a transnational capitalist class. Um, and which is taking place, I mean, uh, also in, in a more literal sense than the uh, Warren Loose one, which Leslie Sklar uh, uh, deals with it in his book with the same title. But it is a, a significant new phenomenon, for instance, when, when Japanese corporations uh, appoint non-Japanese as uh, CEOs, chief executive officers, or, um, or when Deutsche Bank uh, appoints an, an Indian, I mean, as his uh, uh, new uh, uh, executive director. There is uh, uh, something important going on, and, and it certainly is affecting uh, class relations in the world. We feel that very much in, in Europe, where this transnationalization of the capitalist class is a, um, is a great uh, stimulus for uh, economic polarization for um, uh, capitalist grabbing, uh, pointing to the uh, remunerations of American executives. I look at that as we, we have to be paid the same uh, as they are. And this raises the question then whether uh, uh, we are heading for something which might be called a transnational ruling class. Uh, this is something which we might uh, discuss uh, later on, uh, either today or in the seminar. I think we should be careful about that, because a ruling class rule still has to operate through states and nation states. And um, uh, therefore, I'm rather skeptical about the least short-term prospects of, of, of seeing a transnationalist, transnational, transnational uh, ruling class developing. Here we come to what I think is the, in many ways, the perhaps the most decisive change which has happened since the 1970s. Uh, and that is uh, what I uh, uh, here call the suspension of the grand dialect. Um, you know, I mean, the, the Marxian analysis of capital is focused on a, a contradiction between the forces of production and the relations of production. The forces of production basically referring to technology and to the uh, ways and manners in which productivity was ensured 
at, at a given point in time, also referring into organizational uh, arrangements. And uh, the uh, Marxian prediction, historical prediction, was that the forces of production would have an increasingly social character, uh, which would, which would uh, mean an increasing conflict uh, with the private capitalist relations of production. On the whole, I would say that this was a, it was one of the best predictions of 19th century social science. Uh, it did actually happen, although not in any uh, uh, apocalyptical uh, uh, way. Um, but uh, from the late 19th century until the 1970s, you had a general tendency for um, uh, communications, transport, energy production, uh, and uh, also uh, forms of it, uh, of industrial production to be um, uh, nationalized or uh, alternatively uh, increasingly publicly regulated. And this happened, I mean, regardless of the political uh, color of the government, you know, it might take different forms, uh, uh, more radical or more conservative. But nevertheless, I mean, you have this this uh, 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 tendency that you can see, I mean, if you look at the, the operation of telephone companies, or, uh, of um, the, um, the London Underground, or uh, the um, Swedish Railways, or whatever, what have you. There was this, uh, uh, this long-term tendency of a, uh, an expansion of the state and you know, state regulation in order to uh, correspond to this increasingly social character of the what Marx called the forces of production. But then, around the 1970s, I mean, it's impossible to pin down uh, at one particular moment. Around the 1970s, uh, this uh, started to change. And in, instead, we set in motion of uh, privatizations of, uh, for instance, I mean, you can see it most easily in communications, transport, uh, uh, energy uh, provision, uh, but also, also in, in, in other, other areas. And these privatizations have taken place uh, regardless of the uh, political uh, label of the government by social democratic government, by conservative government, by liberal government, uh, by Christian democratic government, by quasi uh, Muslim uh, authoritarian governments. Um, and I, I think this is not uh, uh, something which has happened, I mean, just uh, because of an ideological change. Uh, I think this is uh, something which has been caused uh, by a change in the uh, uh, forces and the relations of production. And to summarize this, I mean, this is only uh, a, a, a brief, crude summary of it, and it hasn't been properly uh, investigated yet. Uh, 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 I uh, one aspect of the more private character of the forces of production is, of course, the electronic revolution, which has made uh, micromanagement uh, and uh, 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 monitor, private monitoring from afar uh, uh, possible. And um, one of the things this has made possible, which uh, uh, is the privatization of railways and the division. Of, of, of uh, companies running trains and, and companies running tracks. Um, and uh, customer sized, uh, custo uh, customized uh, forms of, of production and of manufacturing, for instance. 
And uh, uh, at the side of the private relations of production, the, the quantum leap of, of um, uh, financial accumulation, uh, both through um, uh, new forms of, of, of trading, but also because of the maturing of um, vast pools of capital in insurance companies and pension funds um, have uh, made it possible, I mean, for private capital to, to um, finance almost uh, any uh, investment. So this is a, a major change and which I think underlines the, underlies the, the, uh, the defeats of the left and of labor movements in the uh, last decades. There's also, following from the uh, deindustrialization of the advanced capitalist countries, uh, there is a, what we may call a displacement of the little dialect. Uh, you may ask, I mean, why I talk about grand and little dialectic? Well, it's, it, it's a kind of, of course, a metaphorical expression which is, uh, to some extent, uh, inspired by the um, uh, the distinction is sometimes made in anthropology and religious history uh, about grand traditions or great traditions and little traditions. Well, uh, uh, regardless of what you think of the, uh, uh, the expression, the little dialectic, of course, refers to the, to the class struggle and that the idea that the development of capitalism generates <coughs> workers, workers' demands, workers' organizations, and class conflict. Again, I mean, I, I, uh, one of the best predictions of 19th century social science. But with deindustrialization, this has, of course, uh, weakened at the uh, core of the world system, whereas it has been strengthened in, in certain other areas of the world, in Brazil, South Korea, uh, and currently in China. Um, then we should say a few words about the, 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 uh, the, the state specifically. I mean, what, is, what has happened to capitalist states in the past third of the century? Well, there are more capitalist states than there were uh, uh, previously, and they are bigger. I, I mentioned uh, both of them, both aspects, I suppose. Um, we should also take uh, notice that they are uh, they play a uh, more important redistributive role than uh, previously. Uh, it's not uh, uh, they are not certainly not more redistributive in terms of uh, um, uh, income groups or classes, but <coughs> demographic. <coughs> Um, with um, uh, important support, both of the elderly, with the maturing of pension systems, and of, um, and of children. And there are many fewer, uh, much fewer dictatorships today than uh, there were in the 1970s. Terrible period in many parts of the world, Latin America in, in particular. But uh, as we shall uh, 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 look into a bit more closely uh, in a moment, it's also interesting that they are more capitalistically, capitalistically organized than they were in the 1970s. And they are as imperial and as violent uh, as ever. I mean, the, the idea of a post-Cold War peace and peace dividend, uh, dividend has uh, disappeared or uh, um, never materialized, as you all know. Um, in, the, in the book, uh, I was grappling with, uh, a, um, with a question about the, the, the state apparatus, which if we leave out the, the particular political conjuncture in which this was discussed, uh, the more analytical and theoretical problem was that uh, uh, in what way can we say 
that the form, the organizational form of the state is an expression of social power, and of class power, and class domination. Uh, and for that, uh, uh, in order to deal with that, I, I looked at the, the, the state as a, as a functioning system in its relation to the rest of society with uh, inputs uh, uh, from society they've been transformed in the operation of the state and sort of uh, uh, coming out as outputs of policies of uh, behavior of state personnel to the rest of society. Um, I don't, uh, I shan't bore you, I mean, with uh, repeating the details here, but just to uh, uh, something about the changes of the forms. And uh, one of the things which uh, uh, has happened, I mean very strongly, I mean since the 1970s, is the, is the blurring of the once very distinct uh, private public uh, line of demarcation. Um, and the um, um, the uh, uh, what is sometimes called the outsourcing of a number of state functions, uh, including um, um, state functions of repression, the running of prisons, uh, of, um, of uh, and the provision of armies, or security personnel, as it's often called. Um, this is something quite, uh, uh, quite new in the history of the capitalist state. And actually reminds us of the pre-capitalist feudal state, which was characteristically uh, 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 kind of characterized by this blurring of the uh, public-private function. And when, uh, when taxes were uh, collected by so-called tax farmers, outsourced, uh, 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 outsourced tax collection. This, as far as I know, hasn't happened yet, or, or, but it's something which we might expect. I mean, certainly in the United States, I mean, some of them come up with the idea of, of, of uh, reintroducing tax farming. Um, there is another uh, 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 way in which the states have become, uh, have changed from state apparatus, and that is the, the, the so-called new public management, which has been pushed by the OECD since the uh, early 1990s, or late 1980s, actually, um, and um, with the um, uh, view of, of state, the apparatuses or agencies of the state as profit centers or cost centers, and um, supposedly uh, operating in quasi uh, uh, markets, and the uh, division of the uh, between uh, uh, providers of services and, and, and uh, uh, the uh, payment for kind of marketization of, of the state uh, uh, apparatus. Uh, rather similar to the way in which uh, modern corporations are often uh, organized. And this is, a, again, I mean, a very new development, very different from <coughs> engineering technocracy or the barbarian bureaucracy. There was also, one should say, although it's, it's a minor phenomenon in the world scale, there were also some attempts in the 1970s in some progressive countries, in social democratically run countries, uh, to uh, uh, change the state apparatus in a more democratic way, uh, which included uh, the uh, uh, compressing the state hierarchy and opening up internal mobility channels uh, among uh, uh, 
public employees, and of course also included uh, uh, agreeing to wide um, possibilities of collective bargaining within the state. Uh, a third a new uh, uh, important aspect of the capitalist state uh, is the, its um, active promotion of uh, uh, capitalist social relations and its, its um, uh, consistent attempt to break up wage earner societies and to uh, uh, make societies, I mean, or individuals of, or people of societies conceive of themselves as, uh, as little entrepreneurs, all of them, little individual entrepreneurs. Um, they, uh, uh, this was a, a major phenomenon uh, of, the, of the 1980s uh, with the twin developments in, in the UK and in Chile. Um, and it reminds us again, I mean, of the uh, early stages of the capitalist state in which the promotion of capitalist relations against uh, and the breakup of feudal uh, relations, I mean, was, uh, was an active, uh, was an important part of, of, of state policy. Now, how do we explain uh, uh, this, uh, uh, what we might call capitalist re-feudalization of the state? Uh, well, I, I do think, although this is a, still a hypothesis, I mean, not a, I wouldn't say I, mean, I, I have the full evidence and explain the mechanism for explaining this, but I think it should be seen as part of the private turn of the forces of production, the development of new forms of technology in, in the organization of the state. Um, it's, uh, uh, I think that's the main reason, but the, it's worldwide uh, uh, the spread, or very uneven worldwide spread, uh, spearheaded by the Anglo-Saxon countries and uh, by Chicago boys, uh, uh, Chile, uh, um, is that um, it probably is also related to the weakness of the pre capitalist absolutist state, which is a characteristic of uh, what is its absence in the United States and its weakness in the uh, rest of the uh, Anglo Saxon countries. Um, it is very different, I mean, from the state traditions of, say, Japan, Germany, or France. Uh, well, well, the end is in, it, it almost in sight. I, 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 um, but we should uh, probably, I mean, say something about uh, uh, capital rule and the uh, problematic of state government which uh, was dealt with in the, in the book in, in uh, two forms. I mean, the four months of representation, how, how is capital uh, represented in, in the state? If we, we, we cannot conceive of the ruling class and ruling class rule as a, 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 a group of, of um, cigar-smoking bankers telling, I mean, the president and the prime minister, I mean, what to do, uh, we have to, to think of, I mean, how this kind of ruling class rule uh, uh, can be uh, represented in the functioning of the government and of the state. And there is also the, the problematic of uh, uh, the of class relations mediated by the state, the relationship of the ruling class or ruling forces you can because this kind of analysis can be was used for other uh, social forces in case you should want it. Uh, the, the ruling class, the state, and the ruled classes. Um, something which the book didn't uh, uh, quite deal with systematically, and which I don't have time to go into here, is because the, the, the capitalist class which has to be represented uh, can be very and is actually very differently structured in different parts of the world. 
and here are some of the dimensions, I mean, of, of, of uh, uh, structure, which uh, all bear upon uh, ruling class or rule and capitalist class or rule or uh, capitalist rule. Including, I mean, the last dimension of cultural embedding, uh, which wasn't dealt with in, in that book, but which I paid some attention to in other in other studies uh, uh, related to the uh, different uh, roads or pathways to, to modernity in the world. So we we have to leave uh, that and just sort of make a few observations about what has happened I mean, to the formats of, of uh, representations. Well, one of the most notable things, uh, I think, is the, the, the recent uh, emergence of um, national, uh, of leading national businessmen as national political leaders. Uh, Berlusconi in, in Italy, the Italian uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, or the Chilean President uh, Sebastian Piñera uh, are the perhaps most uh, well-known and notorious examples. But you also have uh, uh, Taksin and Yongak Shinawatra in, in Thailand or the now outgoing uh, uh, President of Guatemala, Alvaro Colón. And you have many others. Um, a phenomenon which has not been that frequent in, in modern capitalist history. And, and the, the return, or, or well, or the, perhaps not the return, the new emergence of um, the, the richest businessman of the land uh, as the political leader is, is an interesting and notable uh, phenomenon. Uh, the importance of the bourgeois party, I, I think, is, is underlined. I mean, by in countries in which there has never been a, a functioning modern mass bourgeois party. Argentina is the best example, um, and that's why uh, the uh, Argentine uh, uh, right has never been able I mean, to, to win I, um, uh, an outright democratic election. I don't uh, have to uh, rely on, on, on fraud or on military dictatorship, or in the particular case of, uh, of Menem, I, um, uh, a defection of uh, the, the president from his own from his own movement once he was elected. And uh, you can see that in, in, in uh, last Sunday's election in, in Argentina, when uh, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner uh, won a landslide at the victory. And the second, the second uh, run of I mean, that election was actually in socialist countries. Um, well. I don't, uh, this, uh, uh, given, I mean, the time, I should perhaps just leave this uh, 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 as it, as it uh, 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 stands. There has been a decline of, of repression in the sense that there are many fewer dictatorships, whereas surveillance, or state of surveillance, has expanded. And there is the phenomenon which you know uh, in, in Madison better perhaps than any other place in the world, a uh, new Anglo-American anti-unionist. Uh, but I should end by uh, saying that I think that, um, uh, well, two things. I mean, one, one is that uh, the defeats of the left, I mean, uh, in the world, uh, the weakening of progressive movements since the 19th 70s is uh, not just an ideological phenomenon. I mean, it's something which has a, a, a structural basis and which can be explained in, in, in Marxian terms uh, with what has happened, I mean, to the relation between the 
relations and the forces of production. And that was also, I mean, the, uh, the underlying structural force for the implosion of the Soviet Union. It never really uh, made it, I mean, from industrial socialism to a post-industrial socialism, whatever it other weaknesses of, of uh, authoritarianism and uh, repression. Um, but, uh, and that uh, the, the suspension of the Grand March in the Electric also implies in the weakness of popular class forces in, in the rich countries. But I think what we are seeing now in the beginning of the 21st century, how far it will take us, um, we don't know, I think, I certainly don't, uh, is a return of class in which we can see in, in several dimensions. One is that uh, uh, when the geoeconomic shift uh, of, of capital and the rise of uh, the whole of East Asia, North and South, and the development in, in Brazil, Argentina, and uh, 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 other parts of the world, uh, the distinction between rich countries and poor countries is of diminishing importance in, in relation to the uh, 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 divide between rich and poor classes. And we see already, I mean, the salience of, of the, uh, uh, what you may call the Marxian little dialect, class, everyday class conflict, um, very pronounced in China, very localized and not threatening the regime in any foreseeable future, but nevertheless really developing and changing social relations in, in China. And uh, it was one of the reasons underlying the, um, the revolution in Egypt. Uh, we haven't had the time to go into it. And we have seen the, um, and, uh, reconfirmed again in the recent Argentine election, the realignment of the popular classes in Latin America. Not everywhere, not in Mexico, uh, what would happen in, in, in Chile is difficult to foresee, although the right-wing regime has is, is become incredibly unpopular. And uh, the uh, financial capitalism has created uh, or a, a, a rift between the oligarchy and the middle class and for the first time since 1848 in Europe. Uh, we can now see, I mean, the middle class in the streets on the progressive side of the, of the country. I can tell you, I mean, none of us who were around in the 1960s, I mean, could have dreamt of that our parents, if we came from a middle class background, I mean, that our parents would uh, join us in the streets uh, of demonstrations. Uh, but that's something, I mean, we just happened, I mean, throughout the Mediterranean uh, in, in this year. And finally, there is a, a new ideological dynamic developing that I'll talk about tomorrow. So we have time to begin our discussion. Uh, of course, we have three days. Uh, Jorn will also be available in his office for uh, more informal discussions. Um, you can come up and see him afterwards to kind of figure out exactly what the best time for that would be as well. The floor is open. Uh, I'll um, keep track so you don't have to <laughs> keep an eye out for who's... Mm. Yes, David. Um, so I didn't really understand what you meant by the suspension of the grand dialectic. Um, mm -hmm. As if the forces and relations of production had always been in contradiction and then it was how to use stop. I mean, I, I'm just not entirely sure what specifically your, your, the, the claim is. Hmm. Uh, well, I mean, that's a, 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 what was a key, uh, key analysis and a key prediction of uh, uh, on Marx. Um, well, first of all, I mean, a, a, it was a, a basic analytical uh, uh, conceptual pair for the analysis of modes of production. 
of, on the one hand, I mean, the forces of production, which refers to, I mean, technology uh, and uh, organizational arrangements assuring, I mean, the, so a, a given level of productivity at a given point in time. And on the other hand, I mean, the relations of production uh, is roughly the same thing as, as property relations. Um, and the uh, 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 idea of the a, a mounting contradiction of uh, between the two uh, in the development of capital was that um, productivity and, and technology uh, would uh, increasingly require larger scale uh, production was the development of industrial uh, technology and would uh, require uh, coordination I mean, between different uh, units of production and units of communication, transport. Uh, uh, and that this uh, uh, could not be done, I mean, by by a, yeah, a, a set of, of uh, dispersed private property owners, and that therefore, uh, well, either, I mean, there would be a, uh, a direct uh, crisis and a stagnation of, of, of development, or there would be an attempt to deal with this, and this is what happened, um, through the um, uh, uh, through state investments and, and state overtaking of um, uh, <coughs> communications, uh, energy production, uh, utility, public utility services, um, key uh, productive uh, enterprises, investment in science, um, etc. Uh, and uh, that these investments and these regulations and these coordinations, I mean, um, of uh, different uh, the, uh, productions and economic activities of dispersed private units, um, this uh, 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 well, the increasingly social character of the of the forces of production. I mean, what what generate? I mean, this uh, historical development of increasing state ownership, state regulation, state coordination. And this is actually, I mean, what happened. I mean, in the uh, from the from the late 19th century. I mean, till, uh, uh, until the 1970s. Um, in, in, in this country, I mean, there was more of, of, of public regulation and, and, uh, than of, of state ownership, but there was, there was also an um, increasing role of the, of the state, of course, in the development of capitalists because of the um, uh, enormous uh, significance of American military, state military expenditure I mean, for the development of of technologies, but the, the what then happened, and, and this uh, happened, this uh, was done. The, uh, this happened, I think, because uh, um, private capital was uh, not big enough to to handle. I mean, these uh, these tasks, and uh, therefore you had this process of increasing public ownership, increasing public regulation, increasing public coordination uh, all over the world. Um, but with the development, I mean, of new uh, uh, managerial techniques, new forms of management, and uh, with the enormous expansion of private finance, this uh, 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 is no longer the case. I mean, the private capital only now has the resources, both the technology, the management technology, and the uh, financial resources to assure this uh, uh, enormous investment and this 
um, steering of the di or different dispersed units of of production of whether of goods or of of, um, uh, of services. There was a uh, last summer, for instance. I mean, there was a um, uh, 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 a new site I mean, the New York Times uh, saying that. Um, uh, Apple, uh, the corporation, uh, had, had more cash available than the federal U.S. government. That's an example. I mean, of the, uh, 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 expansion of private relations of production, which are no longer uh, uh, can no longer be seen as Marx or um, as fetters of the development of the forces. With just a, a clarification, so one description of that change is that there's some process which rendered the relationship between the increasingly social character of the forces of production no longer contradictory with private appropriation. Hmm. Another description is that the forces of production actually became less social in character. Yes, I think both processes and are so, so I understand the argument to say that there is a new mechanism that is the private appropriation itself has a more socially coordinated character because of these scalar issues. Yeah. That, yeah. I don't understand the argument that the forces of production as such become less social in character. That is less, I understood the idea that the forces of production become more social, meaning more com involving more and more complex forms of interconnectedness and cooperation needed embedded in the forces of production themselves, as opposed to atomized, separate, um, you know, uh, decentralized. So the, the description of the forces of production doesn't, doesn't strike me that they're less social now. Less but, what, what I had in mind, I mean, was the, the, uh, um, was the electronic revolution. And I mean, the, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, which has uh, meant, I mean, not only in, uh, I mean, one way we can see, I mean, how it has been, uh, uh, become, uh, um, Less social and, and more more sort of individual. I mean, is in, in communication and, and the internet and, and the uh, uh, um, Facebook and, and, and uh, Twitter and all this uh, uh, kind of interactive interactive media. Uh, well, they are social in, in, in one sense, but they are not. So, well, they are they are not. They they. Uh, they are not social in the industrial sense, with much had in mind when we talked about the, 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 the social character. I mean, they, and the, the same thing, I mean, where the, the possibility of um, corporations and, uh, and managers to micromanage, I mean, from the farm and put together um, uh, complex commodity chains or uh, to, uh, have um, uh, um, uh, to be able to provide um, customer uh, decided kind of uh, styles of, of, of products and so on and uh, because of the, uh, the the capacity of electronics micromanagement. I mean, that, that's what, what I mean. I, uh, yeah. So uh, it's uh, it's both. I think. I mean, I the financial revolution and the capacity of private capital and the, the new the new technology I mean, which uh, electronic uh, management possible uh, monitoring and uh, managing things uh, in, in, a, in a more dispersed uh, way than, than was previously possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I hope we have time. Thank you for your talk. I have a 
hopefully a short clarification question and then um, a broader question. The short clarification question is, I wasn't sure I understood why the 20th century paradox is a paradox between the international context mm -hmm. and the class struggle. Mm -hmm. um, and the second question has to do with, although I know that you're hesitant with prognosis, you're being very uh, modest with trying to predict, but seeing as you claim that there is a, a new feudalist turn in the Anglo-Saxon world, and you know, a lot of the people assume that the lack of relative welfare in the U.S. is associated with uh, the lack of feudalist past. Do you think that the U.S. and Europe maybe are going on the same track in the future, welfare-wise? Um, is is it actually not so much that we're going to still see, you know, maybe an exceptionalism, but the, but the welfare is going to deteriorate in both? Hmm. These areas. Um, yeah, well, uh, I mean, the the um, the twentieth century paradox is, is this: that uh, I mean, that uh, on a global scale, in in in, in socio-economic terms, the uh, divide between classes became. Um, in relation to the divide between between countries, uh, but at the same time, I mean, the 20th century was also the, the period in which you had the most uh, explicit and organized uh, class struggles. Uh, I think that's a bit a bit paradoxical, and it, it, of course, it, it it has to be explained by by the fact that um, uh, the uh, uh, anti-colonial and anti-imperial uh, anti-imperialist uh, 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 conflicts, which you should expect, I mean, in, in a divided world like this, that they were uh, 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 at the same time uh, and, and in, in some decisive cases, uh, crucially uh, uh, articulated uh, with, with class and class politics. Um, with regard to the the other question, um, uh, how, which I understood as how, how how much commonality is there between between Europe and, and the U.S. Well. Um, well, that's something which, uh, of course, can be argued. I mean, in in, uh, in, in world historical terms, I mean, I um, I found it uh, useful. I mean, to talk about the the North Atlantic area as as a uh, as a common common area dominating the world. I mean, in the past half millennium, um, but within that, uh, 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 there are, of course, uh, uh, very uh, very important uh, differences between uh, between Europe and and, uh, and the U.S. and um, they have probably become more pronounced. I mean, in the uh, in the last decades, certainly more or, uh, more rather than less pronounced. So in mean, that sense, yes. I mean the the uh, there is, this, there is this difference, um, and it's, it's not um, it's not convergent, but it's probably um, um, probably growing. Um, and we have seen that in, 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 in recent years, for instance. I mean, in the um, the, uh, the inequality turn in, in the in the United States doesn't have an, an equivalent in continental Europe. It has in, in the UK, but as the gold ones are marked, I mean, uh, uh, Britain is an island uh, between Europe, meaning between Europe and, and the United States. It's not really, not really Europe, and most Brits don't think so either. Um, and uh, there's also uh, something in which uh, the UK is actually part of Europe, and that's the, the secularization. I mean, this kind of uh, religious politics. I mean, 
you have in this country is something um, uh, Europeans uh, find rather sort of bewildering. And, and, uh, so uh, clearly, of course, there, there is this difference, and it's, it's getting it's, it's getting more clear cut in recent years. We're past our usual stopping point at 5.30. Um, I encourage you to come back tomorrow. And of course, on Thursday, as I've said a couple of times, there'll be a time to pursue these points as much as anybody wants to. OK. Thank you very much.